<clears throat> All right, as everybody is joining, we're just going to give uh, people a couple minutes to join. Thank you and welcome. Um, we're really excited uh, for our discussion today. Thanks for jumping on. We'll just wait and we'll start a couple minutes after and um, we'll get started. <clears throat> As people are still rolling in, we will uh, just wait a minute and let people jump on and we'll get started in just a minute. Thank you for joining. <clears throat> All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you, um, numbers are still ticking up. So as we're doing housekeeping, I'm sure people will still be joining, but uh, we're gonna go ahead and, uh, and get started so we don't get cut off on this important discussion today. But thank you everybody for joining uh, this important webinar today um, on matter compliance. Today, we're gonna be talking about uh, device attestation and helping our audience and members of the CSA um, who are participating in the matter understand uh, device attestation and the certificates and the root hierarchy and all the complexities um, that make up this, uh, this standard. Um, I'm joined today by a great group of panelists that I'm gonna have them introduce themselves in a minute. Uh, before I do that, I just wanna do uh, a few items of housekeeping. Um, we will be recording this webinar and it will be made available and sent out uh, following our discussion. Uh, the discussion today is intended to be educational and we wanna promote these materials uh, within the CSA and for all members so that if they have questions, hopefully the discussion we have today can help answer some of those. So the materials will be made available. Um, if you're having any issues with audio or with, um, with the Zoom, please feel free to um, message we have a tech team who are here to support and they can help troubleshoot. So uh, please use the chat feature and they can help you with that. We want this discussion today to be interactive as well. Um, we've done this in other uh, webinars where we're gonna do some live polling. Now, your personal information will not be shared. I, I, I can promise you that. What we're gonna be doing is just looking at um, the audience and percentages, what people are thinking. We're gonna ask you questions about um, the standard, what you're thinking about it, the industry in general. Uh, so be ready to answer those. When the time comes, we'll pull it, put a question up, a uh, little screen will pop up. You just select your answer and um, we'll just be sharing percentages of what uh, the group is, is thinking. Um, so please participate in those as, as you can. Um, we also want, if you have questions throughout our discussion today, please um, either submit a question through the Q&A or through the chat. We'll be monitoring both of those and want to answer questions uh, that you may have as we go through our content. Um, so I haven't gone through that. I will, I'll start, introduce myself. My name is Mike Nelson. I'm the Vice President of IoT Security at Digicert. DigiCert has been a longtime participant in the development of the Matter Standard. We were uh, recruited in the early days by Steve Hanna, uh, one of the leaders who have, has helped uh, bring the device attestation uh, work uh, to completion um, and have helped in that. DigiCert is a global certificate authority. PKI is our bread and butter. It's what we love to do. And we love working with industries like Matter um, on projects like this. And we're really happy uh, at where we are. Um, I'm now going to kick it over to Andrew. If you want to go and then Tim and, and Oscar, please uh, join me in, in doing an introduction of yourself. Hey, uh, yeah, I'm Andrew Contra. I'm the uh, Director of Product Technology uh, at Latch. So I've just been working on Matter um, since about January of 2020. Uh, so very excited uh, to kind of see how, how it's progressed uh, and where we are today. Awesome. Thanks for being on with us today, Andrew. All right, let me go next. Uh, my name is Tim Timboot. I'm a senior manager for branch and product at EVE. 
So I try to uh, get the various efforts streamlined for, for our go-to-market strategies, and I'm thrilled to be here today. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. I just, I advanced the slide so now everybody can see your beautiful pictures too. All right, <laughs> Oscar. Uh, thank you, Mike. Yeah, Oscar Marcia, CEO of Ionti, and we are um, uh, glad uh, to be representing kind of the management authority for the CSA here. Um, very excited to be uh, on board. Um, Ionti has a long history of working with critical infrastructures, um, and especially in IoT. Uh, we have many uh, working relationships with many PKI service providers, including DigiCert. So uh, we're happy to uh, kind of uh, on this important um, topic uh, to be kind of providing the insights in terms of the uh, the PKI and the management authority side for the CSA. Awesome. Yeah, congratulations in the selection of that, Oscar. You and your, your team um, have a good reputation of helping to manage and organize um, industries like this. And uh, Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate your expertise and, and willingness to have the discussion with us. All right, so the way that we're gonna uh, carry this discussion, we're gonna start and talk more generally about um, the state of um, IoT in, our, uh, in the smart home industry. And then we're going to jump in and get more into the nuts and bolts of device attestation. And then we'll end by talking about uh, potential future things. But one thing uh, I would like to do also before we jump into it, um, and I didn't ask this, but I'd like to just make this a little bit more personal. I want to know each of your favorite smart home device, and then we're going to jump into a polling question, but I want to hear what your favorite smart home device is before we jump into this. Um, Andrew, let's start with you. Yeah, so obviously one of, one of my favorites is my my latch deadbolt uh, that I have on my front door. Um, but I also do really like a uh, a connected tea kettle that I use every morning. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, nice. Oscar, how about you? You're on mute, by the way. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to. Um, yeah, um, I, I would say. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation we had, um, was that I just recently bought a house and there are a lot of the lights and uh, sensors around the house are, are from kind of smart home kind of devices. So so I got kind of thrown into that pool of, of smart home device IoT very quickly starting to learn it. So I'm very excited uh, about the matter uh, uh, products and things that are coming up and see how I can incorporate those into. So I, I would say awesome. uh, the sensors and the lighting is, 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 is the ones I have most experience with right now. That's awesome. Good. All right, Tim, how about you? My, my answer may seem uh, boring at first. It's a smart plug, the, the, the number one smart accessory because it's so versatile. Um, yeah. I, I have them all all over my house. They do various things. I actually do look forward uh, to to Christmas already, despite summer being barely over in Europe here, um, to have all the Christmas decoration and, and and lights and the Christmas tree connected to it. Uh, I think there's there's a little bit of magic you can do uh, with with smart plugs, and that's always fun. Hundred percent. Yeah, I, I use those too in in our home. It's it's crazy the automation the versatility and what you can enable with a, a smart plug. Um, I have to say just um, my wife has, I, my answer comes from my wife's opinion as well, which she loves the holidays. She loves decorating. And so she had us get some exterior smart lights that we can, you know, we can do whatever the holiday is. Um, and it's fun to add a little bling to the outside of, outside of your home. Um, all right. Let's jump into the discussion. We'd like to first, let's do a easy poll. We'll start with um, uh, poll question number one. We just wanna know where the audience, where in the world you guys are residing. Um, just warm you guys up on the polling, get you used to this. If you could please uh, answer quickly. Give it another second. And if we can publish those results, please. All right, so a good split, 60% in the Americas, 30% 30, uh, 30 in EMEA, and less in APAC. We actually had a bunch in APAC who asked if we'll be recording this just because of the time zone challenges. So we will make sure that that happens. Thank you. 
Um, so the first question um, I'd like to ask is, um, we'll start with Tim on this, is to tell us about uh, your company. Uh, tell us the devices that you make and why matter is an important uh, is an important standard for your company. Yeah, I'm happy to. So uh, yeah, Eve, if you're not familiar with the company, we've been in the smart home space for about seven years. Um, and so far we have been HomeKit exclusive uh, due to our systems design. That makes us quite unique. Um, we, we never wanted to hook our products up to a, to a cloud. And uh, so far HomeKit has been the, the only real alternative. So that's why we're only active in that space today. But all of that will change with Matter, where you can have full local connectivity and, and secure connections locally without any cloud connections. So we're thrilled about that. Um, and that's why we've been working hard for the past two years to uh, have a product portfolio to move over to um, Matter um, once that becomes available. So um, that, that will help happen very, very soon. And then will be available on all platforms. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. Andrew, how about you guys at Latch? Tell us about your company and the products you make and why matter is important to you guys. Yeah, uh, so at Latch, we, we focus on the, the multifamily rental market. Um, so we don't have a, you know, a direct consumer business or anything like that. Uh, we sell directly to properties. Uh, and so we you know, create products and services um, that essentially help the property managers and residents make their spaces uh, better places to live, work, and visit. And so for, for us, the, the idea that we would have a standardized protocol for all of the devices inside those spaces um, to communicate is, is quite exciting. I really think this is going to expand the number of you know, different device types, different brands uh, that we can support. And so that's going to lead to some, some great experiences for our customers. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's neat to think about, um, you know, not every end consumer is a consumer in a, in a home, right? A matter is going to be sold and the products will be sold to a lot of different audiences. And you guys certainly have a unique lens which you look through on that. Um, Oscar, you want to tell us a little bit more about uh, Ionti and the role you guys play? You, you gave us a little tease in your introduction, but tell us a little bit more about your experience, the reputation you have and uh, what you guys do. Yeah, so we, um, you know, we, we work on uh, what I call trust management systems and ecosystems, such as what you see here with, with Matter, with the, the consortium of many manufacturers. So, uh, and mainly in in um, in the PKI space, that, you know, we, we can work with any type of trust management, but when we look at device to device um, kind of authentication, um, usually a, a public key infrastructure, or PKI, is, is the best solution. Um, we've been um, uh, putting together uh, PKI trust management solutions for critical infrastructures. Um, you know, some of the other areas uh, that we're working on uh, is, is emergency services, uh, communication. So if you if you look at the homeland security uh, critical infrastructure sectors, we're in many of those, and so we bring that expertise and that knowledge uh, to this ecosystem. And, and again, um, you know. Very excited to be involved, uh, especially in this e emerging uh, kind of uh, system and protocol that, that, uh, that will be um, uh, kind of coming to your home in, in, in the near future. So we're, we're super excited. And, and I'm, I'm looking not only to be a management authority on one side, but also a consumer of the products on the other side. So looking forward to it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Let's launch the second poll question, if we can. I mean, um, question to the audience, how long do you believe it will take until matter has industry-wide adoption? Um, things are moving quickly. There's gonna be some big news uh, from the Connectivity Standard Alliance um, shortly um, about matter. How quickly do you feel it will be uh, adopted? And, when I say widespread, uh, we just put 90%, greater than 90% of products will be using it. Is it gonna be less than six months, six months to a year, one to two years or two plus? Please answer that and give everybody a minute to think through that. If we could publish those, please. Excited to see this. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so six months to a year, 19, so 3%, uh, six months or less, six months to a year, 
19, and then one to two years is 41%, and two plus years will be 38%. And I think the interesting thing about this answer is there are so many, I mean, the Connectivity Standard Alliance organizations participating in a matter are north of 300. And I think what we're seeing is that there's a variation of maturity um, in that. And I think that um, a lot of organizations have kind of been waiting in the periphery to see if it will, uh, if it will, um, if it will get wings and, and take off. Um, I believe that it will. Um, and so I, it's not shocking to me that some are, you know, I think that majority are thinking one to two years and two years plus. Curious to hear our panelists reaction to that. Anybody want to take a stab? Thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I think the answers make a lot of sense. So I, I agree with you. And I, I think with most people in the industry, this will take off. Um, so the question is not not if, but but why, when. And of course, it, it will take some time with uh, product development uh, cycles uh, for this to reach above 90%. Um, but I think the, the message is super clear. Everybody will move to this. Um, so it, it, I think it pays off not to wait too long with your product portfolio, whatever space any company is in, um, because this will move quicker um, than, than uh, some of us might expect, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Andrew, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it makes sense. Um, yeah, especially when you consider, you know, some devices may not be, be able to be OTA updated. Um, for those that are, I think that'll be a very quick turnaround. Um, but if you need to do a you know, hardware revision or a full product development cycle, um, I think then we're looking much more in the, the one to two uh, year range. So yeah. I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, product development um, life cycles you know, don't happen overnight. Uh, if you can clearly, if you can do an update, and we'll talk a little bit about that process uh, in a minute, but um, it, may take, it may take a minute to get some devices that are not capable of, of doing OTA. Um, uh, compliant with the, the standard. I, th I think that a big driver of that is going to be, um, you know, just the fact the the strength of the participants. I mean, Google and Amazon and Apple and Samsung, I'm, all of the big tech giants are coming out um, and really promoting and, you know, putting their, uh, putting their stake in the sand in terms of their support of this. And I think that too is gonna to be an accelerator of adoption. I think that that will, will greatly enhance that. Um, let's jump into um, Tim and Andrew. As we, as we dive into, get ready to talk more about device attestation. Um, Andrew, you mentioned uh, OTA updates. Um, what is, I, I'd like to hear what your company's plan is for achieving compliance. Are you guys gonna be updating devices that are already provisioned or are you gonna be doing it, uh, new devices coming off the manufacturing line? What's your, your guys' plan on that? So yeah, our plan is to, to OTA devices in the field. Um, so we'll have a process to essentially get the, get the device attestation certificates um, signed and, and everything as, as, as we need to uh, for devices that are already already out in, in resident spaces. Okay, awesome. Um, so for you guys, it could be quicker. Um, all right, Tim, how about you guys? What, what is your uh, go-to-market plan on that? Will you guys be updating devices or just for new devices? Yes, we will also be updating <clears throat> devices. We are, uh, our, our product portfolio you know, um, in, in some aspects uh, depends on being battery powered. So uh, we, we don't really have uh, that many Wi-Fi enabled devices. Uh, they used to be Bluetooth enabled and we've actually transitioned our whole product portfolio to also include threat throughout the past two years. Um, and, and with that all in line, uh, we can offer firmware updates to all existing customers of those products uh, and update them in the field. Uh, and, and bring matter to them um, with the devices they may have bought two years ago. Uh, so that's really something special and something nice we're looking forward to, um, to be able to update those devices and make them better overnight. Um, but that of course will only be the first step um, after that future uh, product revisions that will bring to the market will of course be matter out of the box. Um, so customers don't have to even perform that firmware update at home, but have a working matter product right out of the box. Awesome. Um, you know, I think the great, one of the great things about the standard is that it allows for flexibility on that. It, um, 
It allows you to do updates, which I think is a great uh, aspect because it allows you to achieve compliance in a, a more uh, rapid manner. And so it's great to hear that both of you, uh, your companies are, are planning to, to do that. And I know that Amazon and others have, have said that they're planning to do the same um, update devices in the field. And I think that that will be great, a great way to jumpstart and get uh, the standard out in the field and, and working. Um, so jumping into the device attestation certificates, I'm gonna just talk about um, the standard calls for three key uh, components um, as part of the root hierarchy. Um, the first is the matter uh, product attestation authority. Uh, in PKI terms, we usually refer to these as roots. Uh, matter refers to it as a product attestation authority. And this is really the foundation of trust uh, for everything that you do with device attestation certificates. Those who will be operating uh, PAAs are required to meet certain requirements. Um, we're gonna ask Oscar about some of those in a minute, uh, but they're required to meet certain requirements to ensure that trust is maintained throughout the ecosystem. The PAA is really the magic that enables interoperability. Shared roots of trust are the way that you can connect devices for multi-manufacturers and do it in a, a secure way. Um, Going down from there, um, intermediate CAs, or what Matter refers to as product attestation intermediates, uh, are then issued. Every participating organization, every manufacturer is required to have a product attestation intermediate. And what that does is it identifies them as an approved vendor and a member of um, Matter and the CSA. And it also provides product IDs um, from the product attestation intermediates, device attestation certificates are provisioned. And as we all know, every matter compliant device is required to have a DAC, a device attestation certificate. Um, that is the hierarchy. And there's flexibility in the way you do this. Um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about each of these uh, components, but at the core, these are the three things. If you want to be compliant with the device attestation policy, you're required to have all three of these. Now, Oscar, I'm going to shift to uh, ask a question to you on this. Why is PKI in this environment and what Matter is trying to do with interoperability and with security? Why is PKI and the use of certificates such a good solution for that? Well, I like. I think you touched on on, on the one point is is that uh, it sets those uh, trust anchors, those roots of trust, right? And and um, the way that um, uh, CSA is going about it is that um, folks that want to become a, a PA have to go through a process, an onboarding process, and so there's there's vetting, um, there's um, you know. Um, looking at the policies, making sure that the creation, the operations, and the um, the, the storing and, and the use of, of these anchors are all according to the policy. And so when you have a, a set of trust anchors that are governed um, at, at a certain level of assurance, then that gives the, the rest of the community that confidence. From there on, you have technical controls of revocation lists and, and OCSP servers that, that can control the, the activeness of a PAI. So if a vendor is, is not acting in, in, in good faith, then you can remove that from the system. Um, if, as long as everything is being operated under compliance, then you have that chain of trust that goes all the way down to the device. And now you have these these device attestation certificates that are in every IoT, every every matter or device in homes. And when they communicate, they can chain up to one of those routes of trust. They know that they are operating under a certain policy. And so that, that kind of gives that, um, you know, two devices can meet each other in the home, uh, not knowing of each other, but they know that they have these strong bindings to these certificates that are rooted uh, in a well-governed system then that, that's really what creates the, that, that foundation uh, between uh, the connection between the devices. Awesome, uh, great explanation of that, Oscar, thank you. Um, and uh, members of, or who, uh, members or organizations who wanna be compliant with Matter really have a decision there. Um, they can host their own or they can partner and work with a company uh, like Digicert. Um, 
there's there's a process and diligence that goes into making um, and making that decision. Um, we're ex Digicert's excited to announce we plan to be uh, the first approved route in the Matter Trust Store, and we anticipate that uh, happening happening shortly. Um, but what can you share with the audience, Oscar, about the submission process and um, the the requirements for managing a route in the trust store? Yeah, so as, as you can imagine, um, this is a very important feature uh, within the, the, the trust hierarchy uh, because uh, a route uh, is only as trusted um, as the community believes that it can trust in it, the, the, the level of assurance that it can, can assign to it. And the way that it's done is through this, this process of onboarding. It's through the compliance to the policy. So it's the hardware security modules for the for the private keys of the route. It is the physical, logical security uh, of the protection uh, of those uh, keys and devices. Um, it is the annual audits, right? So this is not a one-time thing. This is, this is uh, an ongoing process uh, that um, us as the, um, uh, the management authority will, will take on and maintain, again, understanding who the PAAs are, um, running them through the process, making sure that, that on a yearly basis that they are compliant uh, to the policy, um, reviewing audit at the stations there, uh, and, and then also um, understanding um, that uh, from as you mentioned, the, the two kind of systems, one vendor ID, which is a vendor kind of running a PKI for themselves, and then the other is kind of what you just mentioned, did you start kind of playing more of an open PAA role that you can provide the services to many customers? Um, and, and one of the other things with, with, within that onboarding process is that all the participants are, are members of CSA. That's one of the, the criteria. You have to be a member in good standing. Uh, and then that kind of kicks it off, and then we can we can go from there to um, one side vendor ID or open PAA side. Um, but the process is going to be the same. It's going to be an evolving security model um, it, as as the as the system rolls out into the market. So again, it's a living kind of trust anchor system that uh, will be continually governed uh, to keep providing the level of assurance the community uh, will have confidence in. Yeah, and certainly I think the community, if they're not aware to be grateful, will become grateful that we have a good management authority um, like you guys running that. Uh, the importance of maintaining the route uh, through that eco, the entire ecosystem is so critical. Compromising a route creates a lot of havoc um, and, and distrust. And so having good processes around that, making sure that those who are managing the routes are held to the highest uh, standards uh, of compliance. And those, uh, to your point, they're ongoing. It's not like a set and walk away. You have to continually evolve your practices to make sure that you're, you're staying ahead. Um, so Oscar, we, we, on behalf of the CSA, we thank you for your good service in helping to maintain and establish trust uh, because it really is, uh, you know, I mean, PKI is in our core and what we do, but we recognize the importance of good management and good governance and you guys certainly uh, are doing that and, and we appreciate it. Let's talk a little bit about PAIs. Uh, so the intermediates and Andrew and Tim, I'm gonna come to you with a question here. Um, so intermediates are assigned at the manufacturing level. Um, we, you know, each manufacturer is required to at least have one PAI, but, but there's flexibility there. We have had some manufacturers come and say, we wanna do a PAI for each product line. Uh, or each business unit that is trying to achieve compliance for matter. There's really, that's the great thing about the standard is there's flexibility in the way you do it. We've had some that say we want a PAI for each of our manufacturing sites. Andrew and Tim, talk to us about your um, PAI strategy. What are you guys planning to do there? Are you doing a single PAI or multiple? Yeah, Andrew, well, we'll, yeah, start sorry, with, I... we'll, we'll start with you, Andrew. Okay, yeah, so... Uh... I think we're doing uh, one, one PAI at the beginning. Uh, we have you know, our, our plan is to OTA update our Latch Hub product um, with Matter compliance. And so, you know, for now we've kind of sidestepped that question, but I think the, you know, going forward, we look at, you know, the manufacturing environment that we, we have for a particular product or, you know, what our OTA strategy might be uh, to determine whether we need, uh, you know, an additional PAI um, 
for for new products going forward. Yeah, awesome. And the great thing about the standard is it allows you that flexibility. You can you can do that. There's no no right or wrong there as long as you have one. How about you guys, Tim at Eve? Yeah, the same the same thing. Initially, it'll it'll be one um, that was the right decision for us as well. Um, and it, it's great to have that flexibility going forward to to change that if we need to. But um, yeah, right now it's going to be one. Awesome. Um, I'd also like to go back. So um, a big a big discussion now. Digicert clearly has um, uh, ha has motive here or has a market. Uh, we do PKI. We provide roots and. Uh, you know, we believe we have an we can provide an accelerated, cost-efficient uh, path to market for members of, of Matter. But there's really there's a decision. I think one of the first thing members need to do is decide, well, at least with device attestation, is make that decision: Are we going to do it ourselves, or are we going to partner with a third-party CA? Um, Andrew and Tim, I'd like I'd like to hear from you guys. Uh, Tim, maybe we can start with you. Uh, maybe what were your top two considerations as Eve was looking at that? Uh, what were the considerations you guys made and uh, tell us about uh, the decision you made? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to. So uh, yeah, we, we were pretty, pretty deep and involved in all the CSA discussions around this. So we, we had a pretty good understanding of what was needed to be done. Um, but ultimately the, the, the question is um, like we as a team, what do you want to spend your time with? Like you, you have a limited amount of time um, and, and what what do you want to do with that? And for us, the answer was clearly um, that we rather spent that on on product development and and uh, getting getting our products polished and putting more work into that, and and not deal with uh, what what Oscar um, has has uh, said in in great great detail, uh, like really making sure that that everything is is up to the standard. Um, that that's something. Some companies may may be able to do themselves, um, but but for us the decision was clearly let's let's spend our time somewhere else and and have a trusted partner deal with all of that. Um, so so it, again, it's it's a point of flexibility in the architecture that really allows every company to to find the, the right answer for their business strategy. Awesome, thank you, Tim. Um, Andrew. How about you guys at Latch? Tell us about your selection process. What were the considerations that led you to the path you took? Yeah, I think the the big things were you know kind of similar to Tim. There's you know limited limited amounts of time, and so you know from the the perspective of the audit requirements um, and some of the changes to to the CP uh, as as they come through, I think having you know a partner to help us manage those things really does allow us to focus uh, you know kind of on the experiences we're we're able to deliver to our customers. Uh, so it's really helpful to to have someone to to help us there. Awesome. Now I will be um, I, I will speak for on on behalf of the other side. Now there is another option. I mean, organizations can't choose to do that themselves. And what I would say to them is just be aware, have your eyes wide open. Uh, you can do it yourself. Some organizations are well situated to do that. Some are already have uh, PKIs within their organization that they're running, that they're managing. Uh, but make sure that you have your eyes wide open. Look at the ongoing maintenance, the management of it, uh, the unknown costs, the, the resources required to keep it updated. And make sure that you stay on top of that. Certainly things that organizations can do. Um, it's just critical that those who are submitting routes and trying to get PAAs approved through uh, Ianti into the trust store, that they do it uh, and that they manage those in a way that enables and, and maintains trust. And so make sure that, um, and we are happy to, to help organizations kind of navigate those uh, those waters if they have questions about it, happy to be a, a resource. Anything else, uh, Oscar, that you would say about that selection process or considerations that they should think of when making that decision? Yeah, I, I think a couple of things. Um, one, as, as was mentioned, you know, understanding the current policy, certificate policy, which, which is posted, um, uh, and also to know that that is evolving. We are having meetings every week, and there's some some um, uh, requirements that are still being discussed and being moved. In. And, and there's care being taken to make sure that it's not disruptive in terms of the current published version, but you will have uh, a version of the CP. CPs are living documents, so they're going to get published 
uh, especially in the early days of an on-ramp of, of an ecosystem. Uh, it's not surprising to see uh, an update come out quarterly, you know, and eventually you settle down into kind of yearly or bi-yearly um, as, as the systems and requirements and settle in. But all of those changes have to then be updated on your practice statement on your CPS. So, so each PAA and each PAI and anybody operating what is, what is an authority within the system has to be able to create the practice statement, which is the how they are managing the, uh, the requirements and operating to, to compliance of those requirements. So, so there is ongoing stuff. And, and lastly, I would, I would say, as I mentioned, you know, these discussions are happening uh, with, within the working groups. And so if you are planning or, or looking to be one of those, uh, you know, PAs, uh, being uh, active in those discussions is very important, uh, at least even just listening in so you can understand how these decisions are made when they're coming and, and to be ready for them. Great suggestion. Um... We've had some questions and we're going to wait to answer some of the questions that have come in. I just want you guys to know we see them. We're going to get to those. And I, I promise you we will. Uh, we're, we're not uh, overlooking your questions. Very good questions are coming in and, and um, we're going to get to some of them through the natural discussion that we're having and the questions that we are planning to discuss. And then we'll we'll get to the others in our Q&A. Um, I'm curious. If, let's launch our third poll question. We were talking about PAIs and how there is flexibility around the volume. I, I'd really like to know what members are thinking here. Uh, are is anyone planning to do a multi PAI out of the gate? So if, if people will please answer and respond to that. If you are a participating member, please let us know what your strategy is. If you don't know, uh, you don't have to answer this. Go ahead. Send a quick Slack to your boss if you don't know that. All right. Let's, let's publish the results. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think that uh, is not shocking. 76% are planning to do singular PAI and 24% is doing PAI. That's actually higher than I thought we would see on the multiple PAIs, but that uh, that's good. I know that we have a handful of organizations that are looking to do that. Reaction, are you guys surprised to see that? Doesn't look- Yeah, like I, mean, I think it's, it's definitely- De yeah, definitely a, a higher percentage than than I would have expected, particularly yeah. particularly right out of the gate. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so now let's jump down. We've talked about PAAs, we've talked about PAIs and the decisions and considerations there. Let's jump into device attestation certificates. And I'm going to ask Andrew to give a 101 on what a device attestation certificate is. Andrew? Yeah, so these are these are certificates that are, are unique to each device. Uh, and so essentially what they're able to do is allow um, an individual device to crypt, uh, cryptographically convey to a commissioner that the, uh, the, the current certification status of that device. Uh, so the commissioner can then use that information to guide the user uh, to make an educated decision on whether or not they want to add that, that product to their home. Very well said. Tim or Oscar, anything you guys would like to add on that? Device attestation certificates and their importance. Well, I think I think as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, these are kind of like the driver's license of the device, right? So you have devices coming from various different manufacturers into a home, and a homeowner has to make sense of it very quickly. And you want it to be easy, right? You want it to be transparent, almost. And and uh, when the devices can, uh, you know, uh, in home uh, can connect and and have that strong binding and, and authentication to each other that that makes the connections a lot easier because I think you know getting the products to the home people are excited they want to try these things and getting in, and they take it out of the box and then they want it to work and and so the easier you can make that and the stronger you can make those those connections uh, for me that's that's a good thing yeah totally I love the, the concept of the driver's license. Um, it's, it's an anchor of trust and it, um, an identity, um, trusted identity. Um, the great thing about device attestation certificates as well is there's, and so one of the challenges is the provisioning. How do you get the certificate to the device? And there's flexibility in how you do that. Um, we have some who are provisioning certificates to chipsets and I know are thinking about doing that. Uh, while others are um, provisioning at the point of manufacturing. 
uh, and Andrew and Tim, both of you are, are talking about doing that to devices in, in the field. Um, talk, to, um, talk to me about, um, Tim, the process and how you guys came about your, uh, it's, it sounds like you're doing it to devices in the field. At some point, will you guys be provisioning on the manufacturing line as well? Yes, yes, we will. So, so that that sort of goes back to the whole ease of use argument. So, um, obviously, the devices the customer has bought two years ago don't know the first thing about this DAC thing. Uh, so, so uh, they'll be provisioned in in the field, uh, and that that's great. Um, but just to make the process very straightforward and easy um, for for devices um, being manufactured uh, in in the future. Um, they will just have the whole set at the factory, um, and uh, that, that will make the process much easier. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great to have both possibilities, I would say. Yeah. Andrew, any thoughts there? Any you care to share that might be helpful for the audience in thinking about this? Yeah, so I think we're, our plan is to, to continue providing devices in the field, uh, at least in, in the medium term. Uh, just you know, due to some of the constraints of our, our manufacturing environment, it's just simply easier for us to to do that, and so it's it's great to have that option. Yeah, that's awesome. Let's launch the the poll question number four. Um, I'm going to ask the same question to the audience: What are your plans for provisioning device attestation certificates on chips prior to manufacturing on the manufacturing line or to devices in the field? Please answer. <clears throat> Give a minute for everybody to answer that. If we could publish that, please. Yeah, that's uh, that. Uh, that is what I would have anticipated. So five percent on chips, sixty-three percent at the point of manufacturing, and thirty-two percent uh, in the field. I feel like the the idea of chips, it's it, it is a great idea, and it allows manufacturers to not have to alter. Their manufacturing process they're putting the chips in anyways and so you know putting it on a uh on a, on a chip before it arrives um can help reduce complexity but it also um it's a process to get that in place and i i think it'll take longer for us to see more manufacturers doing that so it's not shocking to me uh any other reaction to this thoughts from the panelists it's, I, I think it's great to see again the the adoption of both and and having over thirty percent in planning to do in the field is is yeah. I think great news for yeah. matter, um, and I, I think the the majority being um, being uh, on the plan to do this at the manufacturing line also makes sense going forward. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's the it's the lowest hanging fruit, right? It's like. Um, I mean, OTA is certainly not low hanging fruit. There's a process to do that in a secure and a controlled way, making sure that updates are securely delivered and you need to do that and make sure that you're signing your code and doing all the right things there. But, um, but it's, uh, you know, and at the point of manufacturing, I think certainly those are easier lifts. Any other thoughts, Oscar or Andrew on, on that question? Sure. Well, I think from you know from our experience, another uh, infrastructure and ecosystems. Um, these these are all um, um, options and mechanisms that we see. Definitely, the the manufacturing line seems to be the more popular. And, and from us, uh, you know, the further back you go into the system, the stronger we feel the binding of those certificates to those devices are. You know, if it's in the chip, you know, that's that's way early. That's really great. But you, as you said, there's a process and, and, and things that are involved in, in maintaining uh, and, and delivering uh, those credentials there. Manufacturing line, I think, is, you know, we've been in this field for 20 years and, and we have been seeing delivery of, of these credentials to the manufacturing line. So that's well understood. And, so it's a, and then, but happy to see that the legacy devices are also, there's the, that tells me that there is a strong, um, uh, over the air kind of updates, uh, you know, probably uh, signed images or, or information. So if they can get the credentials to legacy devices in the field and get them upgraded, that, that that's even that, that's even, you know, I, I think all three are very important, and, yeah. and glad to see that number on the uh, on the uh, legacy devices. Yeah, for sure. One thing I'll point out here too is that there's flexibility in terms of 
um, the CA hosting, whether you do an on-prem CA or cloud-based. Um, we're working with a lot of manufacturers that want to do batch provisioning, where you know once a month or once they're doing a production run, they'll download a bunch of certificates and provision those at, at that point. So there's flexibility also in the way you're uh, engaging with your CA, with the way you're deploying, whether it's hosted on-prem or, uh, or batch issuance. All right, now uh, I'd like to transition our discussion and talk more about the certificate policy. Now, certificate policies are intended to be governance documents that kind of oversee uh, and govern the way the PKI is operated. And clearly Oscar and his organization will have an important role here. Oscar, what can you tell us about the certificate policy and uh, unique aspects that manufacturers need to be aware of? Yeah, and I think, you know, as, as these um, new type of ecosystems in the past, we've been used to kind of silo, you know, one one device, one product and the PKI kind of handling. Uh, and then, you know, you know, I think most organizations are, are used to their enterprise PKIs and policies that are going there. Here you have um, kind of the latest, you know, best of breed type of ecosystem where you have cloud-based providers, as, as you mentioned, you have on-prem, uh, hosting, um, you might have regional requirements uh, that, that need to be applied. And so this policy uh, is created by the members. Um, and so that's why it's important if you are interested in at that level of you know, you know, participation in, in PAA and PAI, that um, being part of the community that is looking at and discussing, it, these are active discussions going on. Uh, the policy is active. It is is it is evolving. Um, I, I would say that there are some things, um, and I think you one of the areas you might touch on later is you know revocation. You know we talked about auditing. So those are very big items uh, that uh, the the consortium as a whole, as the governing body, uh, have to address and tackle all of all these all these different. You know to provide that flexibility requires effort. And, and so um, having folks' as input and having those discussions, getting the right requirements and, and making sure they apply evenly across the whole community at the right levels, and then um, we, we see a lot of good work happening. Uh, we think that it, it's uh, at a point where it's, it's good, uh, you know, a starting point, but because we know these are living documents and the security uh, will evolve and the governance will evolve, um, I think that it's in good shape uh, right now and it's on its way of, of, of moving towards kind of that evolution. Yeah, good explanation of that. So tell, tell me, um, are there unique things that Matter is doing in the CP or, or um, maybe gotchas that, that members need to be aware of um, about the CP? No, I think I think there are some strong um, requirements that, again that apply to a root, right? Uh, hardware HSM, a dedicated yeah. offline system, you know, and, uh, as as a PAA. Um, and that was that was a recent that's change, a recent, right? Like within the month, right? Yeah. Uh, so so then this is this it, um, demonstrates the evolution of these policies. You know, they're trying to get it right. There's there's a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of things happening. And again, the community comes together, uh, these suggestions are made and then they're adopted or, or, or you know, declined. Um, but this is one for the route um, to be able to have an offline, you know, hardware protected route uh, to, you know, standards that are defined is very important. Again, the only reason you trust the route is, is though the processes and the governance that are, that are imposed on it. And so uh, that, that was a very big step and, and one that uh, was, was done just recently, as you mentioned. So they, um, you know, they're, they're discussing cloud-based requirements versus um, you know, um, kind of hosted scenario-based requirements. And, and one is you, know, you have a PKI service provider such as yourself that have data centers and are all dedicated to that versus kind of a as you mentioned, uh, you know, um, AWS or Azure type data centers that, that are, that can, you know, they're setting themselves up to provide these services, but the requirements are going to be different. They're, they're not, you know, they're, they're different kind of systems, but at the same time, you want them to be equivalent uh, so that uh, a route hanging off of a, you know, DigiServe data center versus one hanging off of AWS 
have to meet the same level of requirements and have to go you know to the same to the same um, type of uh, uh, or related audits that you can reasonably say yeah those two routes are operating at the same level of assurance and and that's still as the system evolves, those are the things that uh, are, are starting to uh, get addressed now. So I, I think yeah. the majority of the stuff's there. Now we're really talking about, you know, the, the, the really heavy stuff that you know, may not have been there at the start, but is going to be added as we go along. Yeah, awesome. So let's let's transition um, to that. Um, we've, we've covered a lot of good content. Um, first of all, Oscar, where can the CP be found, the documentation? So that is that is on again. If you're a member and you have access to Causeway, um, all the documents that are uh, being um, approved, and these are board-approved documents, so they are available there now. Um, through there, you can also uh, find the working groups, the Tiger, you know, security, you know, working groups that are that are handling the ongoing requirements. Um, you can request as a member, participating member, uh, you can request access to to the admin. They're well attended um, and have a strong list. So again, I would recommend anybody um, that is not there now that is, is looking to be as part of this PA, PAI system that that, that that would be a recommendation to join one of those groups. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, so let's talk about, um, we're gonna come back to some of the topics that we've discussed when we open up, when we go through the, the questions from our audience and we're gonna do this last question quickly, but, what features let's let's ask the audience first thinking about the future so clearly what is about to be released is the first iteration of matter uh, there will be updates to it um we've talked about revocation and other things if we can all right this fifth poll question is what features would you like to see enhanced in future releases of matter revocation uh additional auditing requirements uh reducing the number of managed routes to ensure greater levels of trust you can give us your answer there and um, give a minute. All right, if we could publish that, please. Revocation. Uh, revocation is 52%, auditing 26, and number of managed routes at 22. The great thing is, is um, I know under Steve Hanna's leadership, they have already um, revocation is uh, the first line item for the next uh, release. And so I know that they'll be spending time on that. Um, again, though, the importance, it's gonna be continually evolving. So staying on top of the changes, making sure that if you're managing your own, you're, you're making those changes and you're doing the right things to uh, ensure trust. Um, let's, let's conclude our questions by, I'm gonna ask uh, Tim and Andrew, um, as manufacturers are getting ready to start, if they're just joining this and learning about device attestation for the first time, Tim, I'll start with you. What what are the what are some stepping stones? What are things that they can do to get started? I, I, Recommendations I think the that you have. Steps are, yeah, I, I think the initial steps are pretty uh, straightforward. So so um, I mean, being a CSA member helps. In, in, in getting started with, with any of this. So if that's already not the case, um, that, that's definitely a great first step. Um, and then reading reading up on, on the whole documentations. Um, I mean, the, the webinar uh, has, has been watched probably if you're hearing this, uh, but just getting getting this information um, and then, then deciding on, on what path you as a company wanna, wanna take, whether you wanna work with a partner or go through this process uh, yourself, um, it's it's pretty well documented. Um, so I, I think it's it's a lot of of reading initially, um, but it's pretty straightforward. I would say. Yeah, great recommendations, Andrew. How about you? What recommendations would you have? Yeah, I think it, the the big thing would just be to to start on the process early. Um, yeah, as we've as we've covered, there are a number of different options um, all the way back to you know the chipsets that you're you're choosing for your product. Um, and so you know to make sure you keep all those options available to yourself, you want to think about it early um, and find the one that's that's right for you. Um, and yeah, as as Tim and Oscar both mentioned, the you know being members of the CSA, um, getting their hands on you know not just the final approved documentation, but also being able to, you know, see the early documentation and and participate in those discussions, uh, I think is is a great, a great step as well. Yeah, that's awesome. 
Thank you. So we've had a question from the audience about the potential of matter in other industries. Um, anybody want to take a stab at that one? I think we know the, the answer to that. I see some smiles there. Yeah, it, it, it's certainly it's certainly very promising. Um, yeah, obviously the, the first iteration of matter is very focused on on the consumer market, um, but there are you know, obviously companies uh, such as ourselves that are, are looking at this for you know, multifamily markets, uh, things like that, um, and, spe and specifically being IP based. Um, I think there's a lot of possibility yeah. uh, as we go forward. Yeah, absolutely. I know that smart commercial uh, buildings, they've already begun discussions on that. Smart healthcare is on the radar. I really believe that matter will become a known standard for smart devices uh, in all industries where you have you think about an you think about an environment like a hospital, very similar, uh, more tightly controlled than a smart home, but a lot of devices from a lot of different manufacturers, and you need to aggregate data and use it in a meaningful way. I think hospitals, smart buildings, any kind of plant, uh, I think there's great applicability of matter uh, in those as well. Oscar, any thoughts there? No, I, I think that. Um the the time will tell in terms of ease of use um as you mentioned way at the beginning the number of manufacturers already you know 300 uh that you know we have worked with other um organizations that are trying to do similar things and they're nowhere near uh to what's happening here and so what we see um uh, you know, the documentation, the, the governance, the level of effort that's going on, uh, the community, uh, we, we think it, as, as you, that it's going to be very relevant in the near future. Yeah, awesome. All right, another question, a good question about device attestation certificates. So Andrew, I'm going to come here and anybody else can, can answer, but uh, validity time for device attestation certificates. How do you, what's the right way for determining uh, the length of time for device attestation certificate? Yeah, uh, so I mean, the device attestation certificates could be, um, you know, kind of infinitely valid, um, yeah. and so there isn't really a, a limit to that, and so it, you know, kind of allows the, especially the manufacturing um, line, uh, provisioning really does really does help there. Yeah, and a lot of times our recommendation is you think about the life cycle, the shelf life of a device, how long is it going to be out there, and how long do you intend to support that device? Uh, but there is no limit. Uh, you can. Um, that's the great thing with private trust PKI hierarchies is you have flexibility in your validity periods. Now we have manufacturers that are doing shorter ones. They want more tight control. They want to be renewing credentials and doing things like that. That's a good practice. But if you feel, um, but we also have manufacturers who have validity periods uh, for as long as they intend to support that device. Anything else you'd add on that, Oscar? But I think the, the consideration is that, that the manufacturers have to realize that um, the certificate can outlive the device. And then, the, you know, you have to, we always look at what the hacker community does, right? They, they, they will take those old devices, they will pull that certificate from there, and they will try to put it in other devices into the system. It still looks like a valid certificate. And so part of that is, is that understanding how long do you, do you think your device will last? Um, you know, and if you tell me the device is, you know, five years, I'd say put a 10 year, you know, double that. So you can be sure that the user doesn't have a bad experience. But exactly. at the same time, you also know that in 10 years that that certificate will expire and kind of weed itself out of the ecosystem. So you don't have a perpetual cert that you have to keep managing. Yep. Awesome. And then one other question about device attestation certificates. Is it for each product instance or each product type? Every device is required to have a device attestation certificate. So each device, it's unique and required for each product, uh, each device. Um, all right, you guys, great discussion today. I've got a, a final closing slide today, which is um, kind of a call to action next steps. Uh, and our panelists have, have mentioned this. Educate yourself on the requirements. Get access to the documentation. There's GitHub. Um, there's GitHub repository, the certificate policy, all of those documents are readily available for you. Dive into them, understand them, determine your strategy, whether you're going to do it yourself or uh, work with a, uh, a company like Digicert to support and allow you to uh, remove that burden and accelerate your path to market. Um, third, determine your root hierarchy. Um, what are you doing around your, with your PAA, with your PAIs? 
And how are you provisioning your certificates? Do you want to do on-prem? Do you want to do cloud-based? Do you want to do batch? Make sure you have a good strategy in place for that. And then uh, I think all of us has emphasized this, matter is coming. Start moving, get going, reach out. Uh, there's a great community of support uh, within Matter. There's great Slack channel where a lot of good information is shared. If you have questions, make sure you're reaching out and asking. There are tons of willing members who are sharing information freely about what they're doing, about best practices. Make sure you do that. Um, we've already done Q&A. Finally, I'll just say um, we're really excited. In early November, the 7th through the 10th, um, the CSA is hosting a uh, members meeting in Amsterdam. Uh, Digicert, I know Andrew is planning to be there. Tim, I'm sure Eve will be there. I know you're not going to be there in person, but uh, we look forward to seeing everybody there. Digicert will have a booth. If you have questions or want to have a discussion, please uh, come meet up with us there. Um, in closing, I just thank thanks again to our awesome panelists today. Oscar, Andrew, Tim, you guys are amazing. You're great thought leaders. We appreciate you jumping on uh, to share this important information, and we hope that uh, we hope that uh, the members of uh, of Matter will uh, will uh, will digest this content and it can help them be better prepared uh, to achieve compliance. Uh, thanks to our audience, everybody, for for joining today. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy lives, and uh, we look forward to hopeful future discussions and seeing Matter uh, take off. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.